following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the Rhodes Scholar who played safety in the NFL. Now a neurosurgeon at Harvard General. Dr. Myron Roll tells us how he made his dreams a reality. Then... I knew there was something major going on. A nurse with a mysterious disease. They really weren't clear about what it was. For 17 years, she could only manage its symptoms. Give me a doctor who knows me and understands what's going on. See what finally cured her. I just give God the glory for that. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Unspeakable tragedy in Texas. Instead of buses, hearses lined up yesterday to take children from their elementary school. 19 students were gunned down, along with two teachers, by a shooter toting guns and wearing body armor. In the middle of the rampage, both teachers and law enforcement showed tremendous courage. Charlene Aaron reports on the massive heartache in the wake of this evil. Shock and grief gripped the community of Uvalde, Texas, after the mass killings at Robb Elementary School. Overnight, families gathered at a civic center, waiting and hoping to hear their children are safe. This was the scene outside the school Tuesday night as a line of hearses waited to carry off the victims killed just days before the end of the school year. The death toll, 19 students in grades two through four and two teachers murdered when an 18-year-old shooter opened fire inside the school. Authorities say he was wearing body armor and carrying several guns. It's believed that he abandoned his vehicle and entered into uh, the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde with, with a handgun, and he may have also had a rifle. Stories of heroism emerging, including fourth grade teacher Eva Morales, who reportedly died trying to protect her students, and a Border Patrol agent who is said to have rushed to the scene and into the school without backup and killed the shooter. One student describing the horror of what happened. We just hear all kinds of gunshots going off like nonstop, like constantly gunshots. And the world here all scared on the ground, fearing for our lives. Hours after the attack, families were still awaiting word about their children. How long will you wait? I'm gonna wait all I can, you know, uh, I'm concerned. President Biden addressed the nation last night, offering his condolences, quoting scripture and offering prayer. May the Lord be near the brokenhearted and save those crushed in spirit because they're going to need a lot of help and a lot of our prayers. He also urged lawmakers to take action now to prevent the next mass shooting attack. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? Christian leaders took to social media to ask for prayers for families of the victims in Uvalde. Texas Pastor John Hagee, whose San Antonio church is about 85 miles away from the school, tweeted, there are no words to express the heartache of today's loss of precious innocent lives. Our prayer is that the God of all comfort will wrap his healing hands around the broken hearts and shattered lives of these parents and family members. In the aftermath of this shooting, there are growing calls for more law enforcement in public schools, as well as mental health counselors. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Oh, I echo that prayer. May the God of all comfort be with those who have survived this, those who have lost children. Uh, what should be a remarkably safe place, our elementary schools should be the safest places in, in America, turned into a nightmare of carnage yesterday. Uh, it truly is unbelievable. Uh, I moved back to the United States back in 1999, spent five years in Manila, and within uh, the first week of me moving back, Columbine happened. And it's like, what have I come back to? What has American culture turned into? The verse that, that came to me at that point in time after Columbine, when that which restrains is taken away, have we have we lost the restraint in our culture where, you know, we, we go into schools and, and people who, whether you want to call it demonic or mental illness, uh, feel that it's OK to kill little children. 
Uh, it's absolutely incredible. What has our culture come to? Should we not humble ourselves and pray and ask God to heal our land? Uh, that is the only solution to this. I mean, you could talk about gun control, but you, you, you look at the stats and where there is gun control. I mean, gun control exists in New York City and the murder rates through the roof. So what is it that restrains? It's a spiritual force. We need God's hand uh, and we need it desperately in our country today. So let's take a minute and ask him, please forgive us for our sin. Please cleanse our land. If my people, that means Christians, if my people who are called by my name, we call ourselves Christians after Jesus Christ, will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven. Isn't that wonderful? I will heal their land. Let's ask for that. Let's pray right now. Lord, we come to you. We come to you humbly. We come to you confessing that we have sinned. We have sinned as a nation. We have sinned individually. We have sinned in our churches. Lord God Almighty, forgive us. Forgive us of what we have done, how we have turned our back on you, how we do not live in awe of you. We do not obey your commandments. But Lord, we need you. Without you, we cannot do this. Hear from heaven. Forgive our sins. Heal our land. Restore to us that which restrains. Let us not have murder and carnage in our midst. Let us have peace and security, the peace that can only come from you. Hear us, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. In other news today, five states held primary elections last night. Georgia took center stage after former President Trump backed challengers to the Republican governor and secretary of state. Both had rejected Trump's charges that the 2020 election was stolen. And CBN chief political analyst David Brody now joins us for more on this story. So Brian Kemp and uh, the secretary of state, Brad Raffensperger, survived primary challenges backed by Trump. What does this say about the power of Trump's endorsement? Well, I think it's uh, overall good. It's a selective uh, situation. Last night was a bad night for Trump. There's no uh, getting around that. Uh, the, the Kemp situation is very interesting in Georgia. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at what happened, first of all, in Pennsylvania, right? Doug Mastriano, uh, the Republican nominee, won with Trump's endorsement. He was all about uh, election integrity and all the election fraud in 2020, and that's what he made his whole campaign on. He won in Pennsylvania. Uh, Kemp obviously did not do that. Trump was for his uh, challenger, and Kemp won. So why is that exactly? Well, there are a couple things at play. First of all, obviously two different states, but beyond the two different states, in Georgia, they passed an election integrity law. Uh, the, the folks in Georgia thought Kemp was was actually doing a pretty good job. You know, Kemp's got a lot of hits, as you know, on that uh, law that was passed in Georgia. So that's a big deal. So, you know, Trump was fighting against that. Uh, he was fighting against the Republican Governors Association, who was for Kemp. He was fighting against uh, lots of money uh, that was coming in Kemp's uh, favor as well. And also, let's remember, uh, Brian Kemp on the ground to jo uh, folks in Georgia uh, was a pro-life, Second Amendment, a very reliable conservative guy. So, so I think the lesson here is that, you know, if if you're going to make election integrity, that's all, that's all Trump wants to talk about is election integrity. If, if that's going to be the only thing uh, that is the litmus test and at play, it, it isn't necessarily going to work against someone like a Brian Kemp, a very conservative governor in Georgia. If it's part of the arsenal, then that's different. Uh, but once again, if it's just a, a, a little part of the cake, that's one thing. If it's the whole cake, it's much different. And I think that's what we saw last night. Well, our voters sending the message it's time to move on uh, instead of trying to um, look back at 2020. Let, let's move on and let's look forward to new election. Well, it's a good question, Gordon. I think in the let's go back to Brian Kemp for a second. I think in this case, what voters saw specifically was a guy that could defeat Stacey Abrams 
in November. That's what they cared about most. They didn't think David Perdue could do it. So take the Trump endorsement out for a moment and you just put Perdue versus Kemp. They felt Kemp was the better guy. I mean, you know, overall, people like Brian Kemp down in Georgia. So I think that was really uh, it more than the election integrity stuff. And on Brad Raffensperger, if we can talk about him for a moment, and a lot of people across the country are going, who exactly? Well, Brad Raffensperger, as you know, Gordon, is the Secretary of State in Georgia. He spent $3 million. He was reelected as well. Trump did not like him uh, at all because of the election uh, fraud issue that Raffensperger, in essence, certified the election down in Georgia. Uh, but Raffensperger won, and he won handily. Well, why exactly? Well, he spent $3 million compared to Jody Heiss, who was running against him, who spent $1 million. And also, here's the key, and it's back to Stacey Abrams. Brad Raffensperger actually was running ads, especially late in the campaign, saying that Stacey Abrams is suing him in court over the 2018 election when she ran. She believes that Raffensperger suppressed that vote. And so he was running on that, which was effective with voters in Georgia. So this idea that the media is going to tell you today uh, that it, not only was it a horrible night for, uh, for Trump, but it was a repudiation of Donald Trump and all of the election integrity stuff going on. Uh, I don't think it's so cut and dried as that as that in Georgia specifically as some of the reasons I just outlined. All right. Well, let's look at the other race. Herschel Walker, uh, also backed by Trump. He won easily. How, how do you think he stacks up against Senator Warnock in a general election? Yeah, it's it's a toss-up, Gordon. I think it's an absolute toss-up. Very interesting, right? Two uh, uh, black candidates, a Republican, a Democrat, running against each other uh, in the fall. There will be some um, baggage that Herschel Walker has uh, from the past uh, as it relates to, to a domestic violence uh, incident, uh, to some mental instability, uh, his critics will say. Uh, and so that will come back uh, for sure. But I think overall this is a toss-up and definitely a, st uh, definitely a, a race that Republicans can win. Uh, and once again, Trump did back uh, Herschel Walker. So it wasn't all bad news uh, for Trump in Georgia. Of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene won as well uh, in Georgia. And then, of course, in Texas, I should mention the attorney general, Ken Paxson, who was under a lot of uh, criticism there. And he made everything about election integrity. He won against uh, one of the Bushes down there uh, in, in that race. All right. Well, let's talk about the election uh, reform laws, particularly the one in Georgia. Um, if you listen to to the left, it's repressive. It's like Jim Crow area laws. But at the same time, we saw yesterday, turnout was higher than in 2018. So how, how do you explain uh, turnout being higher and supposedly these laws are repressing the vote? Well, it's a great question, and Democrats are already uh, trying to kind of move the goalposts and spin their way out of this. Look, over 800,000 or so voters in Georgia, m much more than in 2018, if you're comparing apples to apples, and even more than in the 2020 uh, presidential election. So, so how do you explain it exactly? And what Democrats are now saying is, oh, well, hold on, Stacey Abrams is saying things along the lines of, well, suppression of the vote isn't just about turnout. It's about mail-in balloting. It's about having access to a ballot. So here we go with the spin game and how they're going to try to work themselves around this. But look, I, I think that was uh, not a good storyline for Democrats and, and pretty hard to justify as well. Yeah, I think it's ridiculously hard to justify. I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in on this one. Uh, Mail-in voting and ballot harvesting is a number one way for political abuse. And uh, why would you ever say it, it, that's OK to, to do? And uh, if you have legitimate reasons that you need to mail in a ballot, then great. But you have to certify all of that. So it, well, it just it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you're absolutely right. And just real quick, I 100 percent agree with you. And on the mail-in balloting, let's remember, you know, the Democrats will say, well, why can't we have more access for mail-in ballots so, you know, people can, you know, it's all about democracy and your right to vote. Okay, great. So let's go with that for a moment. But here's the problem. If you're going to send out mail-in ballots to everybody, how about we clean up the voter rolls in America? The, the problem is, I mean, I'll just give you a quick example. Um, you know, I live in a certain state. Uh, I used to live in another state. I won't start revealing all my private information, but I can tell this the state I used to live in I can still vote there if I want I got a ballot to, to vote in a state I don't even live in this is the problem Gordon you're gonna start mailing out ballots to people that don't even uh, live in those states anymore you got to clean up the voter rolls before you can get to the issue of mail-in balloting all right well David thanks for the analysis and we'll look forward to the midterms you bet all right well also in the news the FBI has arrested an Iraqi man involved in a plot to assassinate former President George Bush. 
Efren Graham has more on that from our CBN newsroom. Efren? Gordon, 52-year-old Shahab Ahmed Shahab is an Iraqi with alleged ties to ISIS. Police have charged him with aiding and abetting an attempted murder against a former U.S. official. The scheme involves smuggling Iraqi accomplices across the Mexican border to carry out the plot against the former president. That is according to a criminal complaint filed in federal court in Columbus, Ohio. The complaint says Shahab visited Dallas to record video of Bush's home and the Bush Institute. And he told a confidential informant he wanted to kill Bush because he was responsible for killing many Iraqis. Turning now to the nuclear threat from North Korea, Kim Jong-un's regime fired three missiles Tuesday. One is said to be the largest intercontinental ballistic missile in its arsenal. North Korea has been threatening to expand its nuclear weapons program. The launch taking place just after President Biden ended his recent trip to Asia. World powers are uniting to confront aggression in East Asia. President Biden's efforts to calm the seas of the Indo-Pacific were met by a show of military might from Russia and China. CBN News correspondent Brody Carter has more on the president's trip to the region. The president's final day in East Asia was highlighted by a joint military exercise in which Russia and China flew missile carriers and a nuclear-capable bomber very close by to where the president was visiting. U.S. officials say it was a show of force, and they were trying to send a message. The fact of the matter is that we have a lot of work to do keeping this region peaceful and stable. President Biden framed his trip to Asia as a chance to strengthen Asian alliances amid growing tensions coming out of China. In a short time, we've shown the Quad isn't just a passing fad. We mean business. The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue Coalition, or the Quad, is comprised of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. Its focus is bolstering Indo-Pacific relationships during a time where Chinese military exercises continually threaten the democratic island of Taiwan. Mr. Biden's explicit warning to China took the spotlight after saying the U.S. will respond militarily if the country invades. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's a commitment we made. Taiwan's president thanked Mr. Biden for his support, while the White House quickly downplayed his comments, saying they don't reflect a change in U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity. I stated that when I made my statement yesterday. Michael O'Hanlon with the Brookings Institute says the president's repeated gaffes say otherwise. I think it's a small change when President Biden has made the same kind of statement on multiple occasions. And so if the White House walks it back, but Biden keeps saying it. Earlier in the trip to South Korea, Biden said he would consider meeting with Kim Jong-un, which did not happen. Meanwhile, Mr. Biden strengthened ties with South Korea, set to resume military exercises that were canceled by former President Trump. Despite being a Democrat and a Trump critic myself, that President Trump was onto something with North Korea. Biden's fallen back on sort of Obama policy, which is ignore them and just hope for the best. I'm a little bit discouraged about that part. Uh, on the other hand, Biden did a good job with the overall U.S.-Japan, U.S.-Korea alliances. Uh, so I give him higher marks on that. Beijing criticized the Quad Summit as an Indo-Pacific NATO that's stoking geopolitical rivalry. However, its military exercise with Russia and recent threats have only drawn the alliance closer together. Brody Carter, CBN News. And the president, of course, is now back in the U.S. Gordon? Well, there's nothing like an uh, impending threat to bring uh, allies together. We're seeing that in NATO. NATO is now actually expanding. Uh, what I never thought was possible, that Finland would, would want to join NATO. They're now saying, yes, please let us in. Uh, Sweden now saying, yes, please let us in. And in light of what China is currently doing, their in incredibly aggressive posture against Taiwan, uh, what they're doing in Hong Kong, where they completely abandon the one state, two system solution. Uh, and instead of trying to be a friend in the region, uh, they're getting known for being a bully. And in that, the other nations surrounding them are saying, we need to come together and we need to form alliances. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to Chinese leadership. I don't understand their posture. It really doesn't make sense on a hundred year timeline, which is how those folks think. They think in very long time periods, if they start this aggressive talk and action, if they invade Taiwan, uh, they're going to leave a stain in the region that will not go away. Ashley? 
Well, still to come, a wave of suicides on an aircraft carrier. Parents of the victims say the awful living conditions are to blame. Hear how the military is striving to address this mental health epidemic. And then later, a nurse who suffered through a 17-year battle with Crohn's disease. See how she was healed thanks to a promise she heard in her car. That's later on today's show. Awful living conditions. That's how one sailor described life aboard an aircraft carrier in dry dock for repairs. He's one of three sailors serving on a carrier who died last month from apparent suicides. Four other suicides have also been reported in the last few years. The Navy is now investigating mental health issues among the crew and taking action to improve their living conditions. Medical reporter Lori Johnson has the story. The unusual string of suicides happened while the aircraft carrier USS George Washington was docked in Virginia undergoing extended maintenance. As the Navy investigates the deaths, it's offering increased mental health services to those working aboard the ship during its lengthy overhaul. Sailors are now being allowed to live elsewhere, such as Navy barracks, rather than being confined to the ship during this maintenance that's been going on almost five years. That extended time is believed to be part of the reason that led six, possibly seven sailors to commit suicide in the last two years. Three happened in the course of one week last month, including 19-year-old Xavier Sander. It was a construction site, and he worked 12-hour shifts at night. So he couldn't sleep during the day on the ship. His parents recalled their son describing cramped, hot, noisy living conditions. We are always, Xavier, it'll get better, not knowing really what the conditions really were. It's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Natalie and Lamont are also grieving the loss of their son, Mikhail Sharp. All I can constantly think about is when he was born, his smile. After touring the carrier, Virginia Representative and Navy veteran Elaine Luria described many of the sailors as being new to the Navy and quite isolated. She wants information about possible leadership issues and whether the sailors were provided adequate mental health services. The sailors are going through a really tough time because of these losses, especially sailors who had a personal connection um, to those who were lost recently. I think as far as command climate is concerned, I have concerns um, about some things on the ship, but I didn't see any, you know, large red flags. The U.S. Navy issued a statement saying the circumstances surrounding these incidents vary and it's premature to make assumptions as some incidents remain under investigation. In addressing the deaths, the commander of the Atlantic Naval Air Forces said prolonged ship maintenance can be more difficult than most assignments, especially for newcomers. But that's clearly our most at-risk population in terms of how they adapt to military life, how they onboard to a command, how they process into a ship that's in a shipyard. Without doubt, more challenging for sailors to come into this kind of an environment um, than others. Calling the recent suicides a human tragedy, Virginia Senator Mark Warner also wants answers. Figuring out how and why and was this unique to the George Washington in any circumstances or is this an even much larger issue across, uh, across the Navy writ large is something I think we're all committed to finding out. The Navy's top enlisted leader telling the GW crew last month after the suicides there is indeed a problem. I understand that we saw the problem and the department has been focusing on it, but the problem is getting suicide is like getting cancer. It's trying it. There are many different causes, many different reasons. Navy well, Chaplain Lewis wow. Lee says now more than yes. ever, sailors need Jesus. The hope that we can give is the gospel message. It's Christ. He encourages people of faith to do what they can for our military. There's chaplains, uh, but more so good Christian sailors who can share the gospel. Or maybe somebody from their family members, maybe it's their grandmother who prays for them. 
who every now and then when they talk to them, they, they encourage them to, to trust in the Lord, to, to read the Bible or whatever it may be. Uh, I knew one sailor who would pass out tracks and you know, only God knows how effective that is. Lori Johnson, CBN News. I don't think you have to look very far to find the root cause here. When, when a sailor says these are awful living conditions, when a sailor says I'm having trouble sleeping, uh, you get into sleep deprivation studies and it's universal. You have a breakdown of mental health. So from an efficiency standpoint, from a troop allocation standpoint, if you're in prolonged dry dock, why are you trying to maintain a full crew and put them through cramped living conditions where they can't get proper sleep? And frankly, there's nothing for them to do. The, the ship is in dry dock and you're maintaining a full crew. It really doesn't make any sense. Uh, why not reallocate them to another ship? The, 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 you, 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 this wasn't short, short term. Uh, this ship has been dry docked for a long time. And then just last month, they announced they're going to extend it for another 18 months. So you're, you're beyond the enlistment period for the average volunteer. Uh, why not assign them to something that would be more productive? And just from a resource allocation standpoint, efficient use of your troops, uh, why not have that be the policy going forward? Ashley? Well, coming up later, the remarkable journey of a former pro football player. Myron Roll tells why he left the NFL to pursue a career as a neurosurgeon. And up next, dehydration, nausea, shortness of breath, only regularly scheduled treatments could keep this woman's symptoms at bay. But see how a voice in the car led her to total healing. Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs, so don't go away. Every six weeks for 17 years, Becky Johnson had to get infusions to manage her Crohn's disease. Through it all, though, Becky kept believing for a complete healing, especially after she heard a promise from a voice in her car. I just couldn't keep anything down. The nausea and the fatigue and the shortness of breath, the stooling was worse, eventually was bloody. I knew there was something major going on. In 2001, Becky Johnson, a registered nurse and medical case manager, was out of town attending a three-day ministry conference in Memphis, Tennessee, when she got sick. As a nurse, I knew it wasn't just a flu. The cramping was too bad. The dehydration I knew was dangerous. I could not drink anything. And I was concerned, really concerned about that. As soon as Becky got back home to North Carolina, she drove immediately to Duke University Hospital, hoping to get answers. They really weren't clear about what it was. After the second hospitalization, uh, the one thing that I responded to was the prednisone. While prednisone eased the symptoms, Becky still wanted to know what was going on with her body. So she asked God for a solution. My prayer was, Lord, Give me a diagnosis and give me a treatment plan. Give me a doctor who knows me and understands what's going on. A year after her symptoms appeared, Becky got her answer. A gastrointestinal specialist diagnosed her with Crohn's disease. She prescribed Remicade infusions every six weeks. My first infusion, I didn't know what to expect. I remember praying through the whole thing, expecting some kind of crazy reaction, uh, and I didn't. I mean, I, it really worked. Becky endured the treatments for the next 17 years. Even then, she trusted God to heal her completely. One day, on her way to church, Becky says he made her a promise. He called my name. It was as if he was in the car with me and said, I'm going to heal you. And uh, I, I just was in awe. Then, on March 3rd, 2017, Becky, a longtime viewer of the 700 Club, sat down to watch the show. Gordon and Terry were praying for viewers. And Gordon said, if you want to be healed right now, he said, you just put your hand on that body part. So I did, I put my hand, I said, Lord, I'm believing you that you can heal me. And at that moment, Gordon said, There's someone you're saying, please say Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And so we're saying Crohn's disease for you. And just be restored in your innermost being 
Let your body no longer fight against itself, but be restored now in Jesus' name and be made whole. No more pain, no more cramping, none of those issues anymore. Be gone now and never return in Jesus' name. I remember praising God and saying, God, I claim that. I claim that. That is for me. The following week when Becky showed up for her Remicade infusion, she told her doctor she had been healed. After performing a few tests, she agreed with me. We canceled the infusions, and I've had no issues since that time. And um, I just give God the glory for that. Because she's at a higher risk, Becky has had a colonoscopy every year since, and every one has been negative for Crohn's. What I know is that Jesus touched me and that I've been healed, and I have absolutely no symptoms. And it is wonderful not to be controlled or be concerned about that, to be able to live a healthy life and fulfill the plan that God has for my life. No matter what you're going through, that we serve a faithful God, and He is a powerful God. And He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you can even ask or imagine. Yes, He is a faithful God, and He is a powerful God. And He is the God who sees you. That's a name of God, it's El Roy the God who sees. And no matter what you're going through, a lot is happening in our nation, things individually, you might be grieving, whatever you're going through. And if you feel alone, I'm here to encourage you, friend, that God is with you. He is near. He is close to the brokenhearted, and He can give you peace, which surpasses all understanding. He is the God who sees you. He has the solution to what you're asking and crying out for, whether that's a healing in your body, a healing in your mind, healing for somebody else, whatever it is today, have faith. Have faith and trust and hope in King Jesus, the name that is above every other name. And Gordon and I are gonna pray for you in your needs. And keep that at the forefront of your mind, that Jesus is above it all, and he sits on the throne, and he is above everything. And before Gordon and I pray, we just want to encourage you with some more amazing miracle testimonies. This is Joanne of Bridg Bridgeton, New Jersey, suffered 11 years with debilitating migraines. They were so frequent, her doctor prescribed inject injections she administered at home. While watching the 700 Club, Joanne heard Gordon say, someone you have had blinding headaches, like cluster migraines. God is healing you of that. All that blood constriction, all of those other problems from this, all going away right now. Joanne believed and claimed the word, and since then she has not had any headaches. Her sleep has also been restored, and she gives the glory to God. Amen. Awesome. Well, here is 93-year young Dorothy of Denver, Colorado. She, for 10 years, had a chronic skin condition on her left hand. The red, irritating bumps offered required antibiotics. Watching this show on May 4th this month, this year, Dorothy heard Ashley say, I believe someone is watching a woman and you have like a patch on your left hand. It's a skin issue. I believe that the Lord is healing that for you. It will no longer be there after today. Just believe and receive this healing and thank God for it. Well, Dorothy claimed her healing. By the next day, the bumps were completely gone. Mm -hmm. Realize that God sees you. He is the God who reveals himself to you. He promises to manifest himself. That title that Ashley just referenced it comes from an interesting passage where Hagar and Ishmael are um, turned out by Abraham uh, and, and commanded to leave. And she goes into the desert. She's expecting to, go to die. But what happens? God reveals to her an oasis in the middle of the desert that saves her, saves her son. The rabbis say the oasis is, was always there. It just... He opened her eyes so that she could see it. The God who sees me, the God who is all around you, the God in whom you live and move and have your being, he is the God who heals. 
Let him reveal that to you. Let him open your eyes to see, open your ears to hear, and give you a heart of understanding that you may know the greatness of his power. Now, how do you get that revelation? You ask for it. Ask him to open your eyes. Ask him to open your ears. Ask him to give you that heart to understand. Praise him for the answer to that prayer. And in that, walk into your healing. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's right next to you. All you have to do, open your eyes and you can see it. And when you see it, you get all the faith you need to believe for healing. Let's pray. Let's believe God and let's thank him and he will show up for you. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we ask that you would open our eyes, that you would take the veil away, that you would open our ears that we could hear your voice, that you would give us a heart of understanding that we would know that your kingdom is right here. It's in our midst. Give us this, Lord God, that we may see our healing. We may understand the greatness of your power. We thank you for answering our prayer. We thank you for your presence. Now cleanse us from all sin, all iniquity, all disease in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a severe infection in both of your lungs, but it's the real pain and it's a searing pain with every breath is in your right lung. God is healing you of that. He's restoring your lung tissue. He's taking all of that pain away, all that inflammation. Be gone now in Jesus' name. Be healed. Ashley? Yeah, I believe someone's watching. I don't know if it's the same person, but I heard bronchitis. If this severe infection is bronchitis, I believe this is for you. The Lord is healing you. I just believe the Holy Spirit is touching you even right now. Just begin to praise the good Lord. He sees you. He loves you. You're healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've got leaking spinal fluid. Uh, in, it's in the back at the base of the skull. Um, I'm hearing the word brainstem. Um, God is healing that. He's able to, to seal that up, and so it won't leak anymore. And there are a lot of problems associated with this. Be healed of all of them right now. Be restored and be made whole. Yeah, I heard some, I heard polyps. I just believe somebody is watching with polyps in their sinus cavity and it's creating a lot of issues um, affecting your everyday life because of this. And I believe the Lord is healing that for you right now. I believe that those polyps will be there no more. And the issues that have come about because of that, they will be cleared up and you will not have to struggle with this or suffer with this any longer in Jesus' name. I, I don't know if it's the same person, but you've actually had surgery on the polyps and the polyps have grown back. And so when you're hearing that you're healed, you're going, nah, it can't be me because I, I tried and, and they, they came back. God is giving you this detail so you would know this is for you. Wow. You yeah, would but... know this is for you. Your sinuses are clear. You don't have to fear it anymore. Take that deep breath. Everything has been open for you. All of the pressure, all of the pain, all of that. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Praise him for what he's doing for you. Thank you. Wow. I believe somebody else is watching with an ear infection, a severe ear infection. It's very painful. Um, I believe it's in the left ear and the right ear, actually. And I, the Lord is healing that for you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do, all that you are. You are the God who forever lives for us, whoever intercedes for us. We thank you for it. The God who was and is and is to come. Come now, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that doesn't give up but waits until it gets the answer. So we're proud and honored to, to pray with you, to stand with you in prayer. All you have to do is call, 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Well, you don't need to give it 110% to reach the top of your field, just 2%. Still ahead, Myron Roll tells us how the 2% way helped him land a career in both the NFL and Harvard Medical.
Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention announced it will release a secret list of hundreds of pastors and other church affiliated personnel accused of sexual abuse. This comes after the release of a scathing report detailing how the committee mishandled allegations of sex abuse and stonewalled the accusers for the past 20 years. The committee expects to release that list Thursday. The U.S. should get set for another active hurricane season. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is predicting 6 to 10 hurricanes in the Atlantic from June to November and 40 to 21 named storms. That follows a trend of busy storm seasons. Since 2016, more Category 4 and 5 storms have made landfall than in the previous 50 years. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Ashley are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Myron Roll was once named on a list of the smartest athletes. Now he'd probably top a list of most athletic neurosurgeons. As a former NFL safety turned doctor, Myron is a man who achieved his dream twice. And he says he's been able to do it 2% at a time. Dr. Myron Roll has led a remarkable life as a former NFL safety, a Rhodes Scholar, and a neurosurgery resident at Harvard Massachusetts General Hospital. He credits his amazing success to a deep faith in God, a strong work ethic, and a simple philosophy. In the 2% way, Myron reveals how you can overcome obstacles and build a life of purpose and meaning by making small strides each day to reach your goal. All right, well, Dr. Myron Roll is here with us now. Welcome, Dr. Myron, to the 700 Club. Thank you, thank you for having me. Of course, all right, well, you had two dreams, play in the NFL and become a neurosurgeon, which I have to admit, not a lot of people have those dreams. Where did they come from? Uh, well, you know, my, uh, my family's from the Bahamas and uh, my parents wanted me and my older brothers to have uh, you know, some, some remarkable role models in front of us when we started over in this country, in America. And uh, they put someone like Ben Carson in front of me. I read his story in the fifth grade called Gifted Hands. Mm -hmm. And he planted the seed of neurosurgery, someone who was so inspirational, someone who separated two conjoined twins who were connected at the back of their head. And both of those kids lived. I just saw his, his career and his talent to be remarkable. So he became my academic hero. And I was also very good at football at the same time. So I had two of these parallel goals sort of coexisting in my body. And thankfully, once I was done playing football, I was able to seamlessly transition into medicine, into neurosurgery to have an impact like Dr. Carson uh, has had on many people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go back to your childhood. What happened to you at the age of 10? You mentioned this situation in your book. And how did that change you? Well, it was a very difficult situation. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I had a bit of a temper. You know, my parents and my coaches and uh, teachers would tell me, you know, Myron, if you do well in school and you do well in football, that's good. And I said, OK, that's all I need to do. And my behavior could be a little bit untoward. I guess this was my um, perspective or my uh, interpretation of what they were telling me. So I often allowed my temper, my anger, my frustration to get the better of me. And one day, a young person, non-black, uh, who called me the N-word, a racial epithet, called my mother the B-word. Uh, I saw red. I beat him up very badly. Unfortunately, he had to go to the hospital for his injuries. He took me and my family to court in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And I remember standing in front of this judge in Atlantic City as a 10-year-old with my Sunday best on, listening to this gentleman admonish me for what I did. And I turned around and saw my mother's face and my father's face, disappointment. Uh, they were they were just saddened by me, their last child, putting them in this precarious situation. Thankfully, by the grace of God, community advocates, a good lawyer, I was able to shake that young man's hand, apologize, do a little bit of community service. But at that point, I think I made the pivot, the transition into allowing my anger and behavior to stop me and prohibit me from reaching my goals and being successful. I gave my life to Christ about a month later. I started joining the school band. I ran for school president. I played fiddle on the roof as Tevya uh, to try to sing and dance in our school musical. I was trying to do everything I could to be different than uh, what my behavior was leading me to. Mm. Well, you also faced criticism for pursuing academics while playing football. Did you ever feel like you should be focusing on one over the other? 
That's a, it's a great question. You know, I, I, I kind of always felt that uh, football and, and academics, they fed and, and they intertwined in my life and they sort of um, helped each other. I, I thought I was a better student because I learned the competitiveness of football. I learned how to get through tough times. I learned how to work with team and, and to communicate and overcome adversity and to become coachable. I thought I was a better athlete because as a student, I was able to meticulously prepare and see the nuanced details of what could make me a better football player by looking at you know, a player's body language and seeing their disposition and seeing they're going to run this way instead of that way, that helped me. And so I always sort of had these two goals and these two roads uh, existing in my life. And I took each step 2% at a time. I write about it in my book, just small steps every day to make sure that I felt balanced even when football and, and academics seemed to collide. I just tried to make them feel on rhythm for me. And uh, thankfully it happened. Yeah, absolutely. Well, once you were in uh, Harvard Medical School, you were a third year resident at Harvard Medical. You had another um, just incident of racism. How did you handle that? How was that different from when you were 10 years old? Oh, yeah. So uh, it was much different. You know, a 10 year old Myron would have reacted, um, you know, with anger and violence. But 33, 32-year-old Myron, now a neurosurgeon at Harvard, uh, one of the best institutions in the world, being able to operate on people's brains and have that opportunity uh, to help save lives. It, it was a fortuitous moment for me. So uh, it was a gentleman who was uh, uh, at our hospital and his brother actually called me again, the N-word in front of my face, mm -hmm. in front of our nurse who was also caring for his brother. Wow. Uh, at that point, the nurse, the nurse apologized to me and asked me if I was okay. I said, yes, I'm all right. I sort of calmed down, took a few heartbeats, went back to the 2% weight process. How do I block out the background noise and just focus on trying to get a little bit better through this? I said, if I could operate on this man and I could hope, hopefully save his life, when he wakes up from anesthesia, he'll see me in my body saving his life. He'll say, you know what? I have a different perspective of people who look like you and thank you for saving my life. So I took the 2% weight process, just taking little small steps to try to make sure that I'm in position to do my job as a neurosurgeon, to hopefully save this man's life, which we did. The outcome went very well yeah. and maybe changes him and his family's perspective going forward. That's incredible. Thank you so much for doing that. I know it changed his life and a lot of other people's lives. Well, last question, Myron, what do you want people to take away from your book? Well, I, I want them to take away the idea that sometimes uh, there could be challenges or obstacles that seem very daunting, very large, very big. Uh, but if we just take small steps, the small little wins and stack those wins every single day, we can make progress a month from now, six months from now, a year from now and feel good about it. You know, we have this limbic lobe in our brain that releases neurotransmitters that are is an excitatory process and makes us feel good. It's a reward pathway that we have. And if we can activate that every day, just to feel that we moved a little bit forward, then, then I think we're moving and we're doing better and we're uh, accomplishing our goals and in the process, uplifting other people. So hopefully people resonate with this story, resonate with some of the self-doubt, uncertainty, challenges that I've had to face in life mm -hmm. and how this simplified step and system process uh, can help make you a better version of yourself. We're excited about it. Yeah, definitely. We're excited too. And you're such an inspiration. Thank you for sharing your story. And you can learn more about Myron and his amazing journey and his new book. It's called The 2% Way and it's available nationwide. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Myron Roll. Thank you very much for having me. Gordon. Well, here's something you don't normally hear from a four-year-old. Brandon says his favorite things to do at home are taking a bath and brushing his teeth. The reason? For the first time in his life, he has access to clean water. Every day, Jonathan and his two brothers walk to the river near their home in southern Mexico to collect water. Unfortunately, that water is not safe to drink. I drank water from the river and it made me sick. There was no water at our house. This is Jonathan's mom, Teresa. She explained why the river water is so dangerous. We washed our dishes and our clothes in the river, and we even took baths in the river. At first, I thought my kids got sick from the weather or bad food. Then I figured out that it was the raw river water that was hurting them. They couldn't go to school. They just wanted to stay in bed and they wouldn't eat. They didn't even want to play. Operation Blessing built the community a new water system. We laid pipe to transport water from an underground stream to a new tank we built within the community. This is the children's father, Gilberto. Now we no longer have to carry water. 
We have plenty now. It has been a big weight lifted off me. Now I don't get stomach pains from drinking the bad water. And this is four-year-old Brandon. I can drink water at home. My favorite thing to do is take a bath and brush my teeth. Our children don't get sick anymore. Thank you, Operation Blessing, because now the water is clean and safe. That thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. You're part of providing that wonderful family with clean water. You, you're able to let them bathe, let them brush their teeth in safety and security, knowing that they're not going to get sick from the water. It's wonderful what happens when people join together and say, yes, let's make a difference. Let's, let's do good for people, and let's do good for people right here in the United States. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're helping many families. We've got over 4,000 distribution centers. We're distributing millions of pounds of food every single month, every single year. It's all because you make a difference. If that's you, if you want to be a part of it, both here in the U.S., around the world, uh, we have disaster relief centers helping the refugees in Ukraine. We're gearing up for hurricane season here in the United States. We're doing it all in your name when you're a member of the 700 Club. So if you'd like to join, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. When you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Extra Express, electronic monthly giving, where the bank is doing all the work, and we can send Power for Life monthly teaching CDs or download your choice uh, every single month. And we'll send you my father's latest teaching, Putting on the Armor of God. These days, we really need that armor, and he'll walk you through the book of Ephesians. All yours when you join, 1-800-700-7000. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest.